Hello, I'm Bob the Booker and welcome to my channel. Uh, today I'm going to be just wrapping up the books that I've read this week. Um, and it's been quite a fun one. Um, I, You'll notice sort of a couple of projects essentially going on in the background of, of this reading, but um, a really nice mix of some of some things, some, a, fit, a bit of non-fiction thrown in there. So yeah, all very good. First up, um, we have two books that were on the 2017 Booker uh, shortlist. And you may sort of notice from that that basically what I'm doing is looking back at what the booker looked like five years ago and how that compares to now. You know, are those books still held up as big, impressive um, works of fiction? Are they still held up as being sort of some of the top books from the time? Um, the thing that has been quite interesting about it has been realising that, you know, there were some, some books by big authors um, that were sort of really popular or, or kind of well known. So thinking like Reservoir 13 by John McGregor, um, a book like The Underground Railroad by Colson Whitehead, um, both huge books which both didn't make the shortlist. But what did make the shortlist, uh, for example, was uh, History of Wolves by Emily Friedland. Um, and this is, I have a mix of feelings about this. It's a bit of a, an odd one, but in some ways. But anyhow, it's an incredibly beautifully written book. Um, I won't take that away from it. Um, but I think I just got a little bit lost by it. Maybe the audio, you know, listening to parts of this as audio didn't help. But um, essentially this sort of concerns the story. We sort of mostly start from a young child's perspective. And we know that various things are happening in this school. A few things go down. Uh, there's a teacher who's accused of something, you know, and there's sort of everything sort of caught up within this school world. And we occasionally do have these little flashbacks um, or flash forwards, I guess, to sort of the modern day. Um, but it's sort of caught up a lot with secrets and the, 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 the title History of Wolves comes from a, a project that she as a child does um, where she's sort of trying to impress the teachers and she wants to just write this like this little report that's a history of wolves. Um, I will say the sort of the setting and, and writing around some of these parts, th those parts of the book I thought were really stunning and really well done. Um, I just think I got a bit lost. I and you know, sort of sometimes like midway through a book where you're sort of a bit lost and you're like, I don't know if this is the time to start it again or just to kind of push through. Maybe I should have started again because I think I was a bit lost, but um, incredibly beautifully written. Um, and there's, yeah, there's a lot, there's a lot in this book that's quite menacing and kind of hidden under the surface, um, which is quite interesting because the, the writing is so sort of delicate at times and so beautiful. And then you've just got these really quite grisly things that are just out of reach and just out of sight because the child you know the, the the narrator is is a child or is kind of fairly young for various parts of this book as well so yeah an interesting one but i want to check out i kind of want to almost read it again and kind of see if i get a different perspective as i know that it's been a fairly split reaction some people have really loved it some people just didn't really get on with it um so yeah anyhow on that same short list we had elmet by fiona mosley and i had a much uh, much sort of stronger feeling of joy <laughs> towards this book. Um, Elmet is told um, sort of focused around a a family particularly but a lot of it talks about place and belonging and identity and how those things are all wrapped up with each other and I found it absolutely fascinating. Uh, it's sort of focused on this sort of northern town um i'm not sure did we get the name of the town i can't actually remember now um but so much of this is sort of bound up with really Im impressive and important discussions around um around place and belonging so for example there's a discussion about um there's a traveler community at the heart of this book and we get a part early on where the the, the traveler family is sort of saying well why do we you know, we've lived in this land for, for ages. This land is a part of us. It's who we are. Um, why do we now have to pay? Why, why do we have to get a, a bit of paper that says that we own this land and that we live here and all of that to then earn money and pay money towards taxes or towards, um, you know, like a, a land, a landlord, why do we need to do all of these things? And it's so well framed, I think, as a book in terms of how it talks about things like masculinity. Um, because, for example, we've got um, a boy at the heart of this who's sort of not like his father. His father is this sort of almost like bruiser kind of figure. He's this sort of strong working class man. He, he, he boxes for money. And at one point, there's this sort of humiliating moment where he's made to box in order to sort of get the rights to his land and so it opens up a lot of really interesting questions about who owns britain who owns land who owns all of these things because if 
if that could be taken at a moment's notice and, you know, somebody could say, sorry, you can't walk here. This is my land. And this is somewhere that people have walked for, for years and years. What does that say? And so I just found this book really captivating. It's written in such a sort of dynamic voice. Um, I'm really keen to read Hot Stew by the same author. Um, and I just, yeah, I was really just impressed by this book and what it does. Um, there, we, we sort of have a character as well, who's a woman who's sort of a little bit more masculine or sort of tomboyish. And it's really interesting watching how the other characters in the book relate to her because some people see her as sort of off limits because of her family or because of her being a bit more masculine or, or what have you. Um, but for some other people that sort of makes her stick out too much in this community and that's something to be stamped out. So yeah, I really, really enjoyed this book. I thought this was so beautifully done um, and really keen to read more of her work as well. Next up, we have We Had to Remove This Post by Hannah Bevoets. Um, and this is it in Dutch. Um, I did not read it in Dutch. I unfortunately don't yet um, speak or read uh, Dutch, but I do plan to um, at some point. Um, but this was very graciously and very generously given to me by Anne Novella, um, who you should all check out. She's wonderful. Um, but she basically mentioned this because I'd, I'd said about wanting to read um, We Had to Remove This Post. And um, in the original Dutch, when it was published, it was a commission book as sort of part of a, um, a yearly book tradition of sort of a, a famous writer being commissioned to write something. Um, and then it's then given out free to everybody. Um, and so it's a really tiny little book, actually, which I, I for some reason, when I see, I'd seen the English translation, maybe because of spacing, I thought it was slightly longer. Um, but the book itself is a really interesting one and is around this idea of somebody who works as... Um, a sort of content moderator to some degree for um for for the internet <laughs> in a broader term and so it's basically looking at on this platform um there are certain guidelines for what can and can't be posted and so some of those are the the typical things that you might expect you know like scenes that are incredibly graphic are not are not allowed on there and there are some things that you know if they fall into free speech they would be allowed all seems fair but then actually there are so many bits that underpin all of that right you know it's not quite as simple as that because what if for example there's a fairly brutal image but it's to do with freedom of speech because it's to to you know it's it's a sign from a protest for example what if um there is something that doesn't technically cross any of the the guidelines but it's morally quite wrong or in a bit of a gray area and so this book i think really beautifully describes and kind of interrogates some of those things um but through the eyes of a group of characters who are moderating it and so kaylee our sort of our main character we watch how she sort of slowly is kind of ground down basically by the big parts of the job we see her but you know the start of the book is her having finished working there and sort of just wanting to cut ties she doesn't want to go through any kind of legal process about the rights of the workers she doesn't want anything to do with it she just wants to leave and to cut that cut that out of her life um at the heart of it as well though within this book kaylee dates um somebody who she's working with and it's this whole sort of enmeshed thing where they spend a work day together looking at some of the most horrific things and then they come home and have to try and be normal people with each other and um, i really loved this book i thought it was really well done um it's an incredibly quick read but so impactful in the way that it it, it approaches some of these topics because actually the sort of the wild wild west that is the internet at times can just have all of these things happen that are just you know the most horrendous things could be posted but there's such a volume of things being posted that really how does that you know how does it all work how does it ever come together who how can you moderate something so out of control i will say as well i think the relationship breakdown between her and um, her girlfriend and just all the other relationship breakdowns around her are just so chilling in this book because of how how we kind of see that it's it's largely like an, a big outside force kind of pushing down on these people who are just trying to live as normal humans but just become these sort of the most you know being exposed to those kinds of things is, is deeply unhealthy and we see as well how some people fall down certain rabbit holes in this book so yeah really really well observed very cleverly done i think and i, I really enjoyed this Next up, I read a slightly chunkier one, um, Like People in History by Felice Bacano. 
Um, and this is, uh, this is described, I mean, in very grand terms, but I do kind of like this, um, as being the gay gone with the wind, hopefully without some of the more problematic elements. Um, but, and that's by Edmund White describing it that way. Um, and I read this as sort of part of a book group and just really enjoyed, uh, a lot, a large amount of this. I mean, it's about 500 pages long and I will sort of say middle passages was a bit like, okay, how, where is this actually going to go? Um, but a really interesting book nonetheless. This is... Um, focused on essentially kind of key parts in um, modern US gay history, essentially. So particularly looking at the kind of what's changed really in the sort of 60s, 70s, leading up to the 90s. Obviously that period covers the AIDS crisis, it covers um, things like Stonewall, it, it covers a lot. And we mostly see it through the eyes of a couple of characters, and um, particularly then their sort of group of friends. Um, their names being, I literally forget people's names all the time in books, um, Alistair and Roger. And they sort of meet when they're quite young, and we then spend the rest of the book sort of watching in various sort of time lapses how they're doing. So it's always sort of the current day and then a bit of a flashback to another time and we sort of see how things change and i will sort of say once we kind of got into the middle passage i think this is also partly the difficulty for me i got a little bit lost about which time zone we were in, any, in anymore because um you know things started to kind of overlap a tiny bit but that's not the worst thing in the world um but yeah we basically watch as they go through their entire sort of adult lives and it leads to what was just a really incredible ending i thought I, I found it a deeply moving and touching ending to this book that was really heartfelt and very um poignant and so well observed the final words of the final page were just so gorgeously done um it's interesting because that all kind of comes after you know this sort of this part where they're a much happier group of people, you know, they're kind of early stages of of queer activism, um, or at least sort of modern queer activism, um, sort of post Stonewall, and they are really kind of enjoying their lives. And it's spoken, it, the whole thing is done with this kind of queer slang. Um, and I found that so captivating to want to watch characters speak in a way that's almost incomprehensible at times, because it's so loaded with catchphrases and slang and um wordplay and, and everything else and i found that really quite interesting about this book because it just um it captures something so specific it is almost like a time capsule because the way people would have spoken you know particularly gay men would have spoken to each other in the the sort of 70s and 80s we don't really have that many carry-ons from that now you know there are some parts of that in modern queer slang you know some parts of it have carried over um a lot of that is sort of also tied in with things like the ball uh, you know the ball scene and like um uh particularly you know where we are now around kind of some of the drag slang and lingo kind of borrows from this time or sort of is a natural continuation from this point but i just found that it was so fresh to watch characters speak in this really kind of for them natural way um that can be completely you know in unintelligible from the, as an outsider sometimes but in a really great way this book doesn't try to translate that for you that's how these people are speaking and that's what's being captured here um so i thought as a sort of historical sort of mini epic going over these characters lives that was really effective and particularly like i said that ending i just thought was so so poignant um a really gorgeous book full of a lot of heart i will say that some parts of that have not aged particularly well um as in there are some parts of the sort of the gay slang and kind of banter that would probably not probably not pass well in a in a bar or whatever nowadays um so you know sort of gird yourself um if you're going to read that but at the same time i think really really well captured and, and a really lovely book next up um i read a biography of valentine ackland uh, called a transgressive well valentine ackland a transgressive life by francis bingham um and so this uh has been shortlisted for the polari prize um and um that's a, a prize that sort of champions um, UK-based sort of writing on LGBTQ um, lives and by LGBTQ plus authors. And um, what I really enjoyed, I think, with this is just I know nothing about it. I well knew nothing about this person before reading it. And uh, Valentine, Valentine, it's going to be difficult to know which one to say, and you'll see why in a second. Um, Ackland was a poet um, who I'd never heard of, admittedly. Um, 
but whose life was this sort of really in follow this sort of really interesting trajectory because she um often enjoyed basically being read potentially as a man um i will use sort of she her pronouns for her throughout this because i think that that fits and that's what the book also kind of follows through is sort of although she played a lot with gender she still very much a lot of the time saw herself as a woman um but she was a poet who started uh this sort of long relationship with another poet um sylvia townsend warner um and sort of between them you know they published a group of, a set of poems together but then they also did quite a lot of their own writing they lived together for many years and was sort of a, a big fundamental part of each other's lives but what's so interesting is for many people externally they were just accepted a lot of people early on sort of thought well, like mm, are they they're really they're two women friends who seem very very close and live together and also seemingly don't have any other partners um there's something going on here but actually largely after a while they were sort of ignored and left alone <laughs> you know most people sort of thought actually you're fine um or, or at least sort of didn't want to to stir the you know stir the pot too much stir the nest whatever that phrase is they didn't want to, to stir up any trouble um but she was a poet who wrote really beautifully and poignantly there are a few of her poems in this book which i really greatly enjoyed um and i want to check out her poems now um and just a really interesting and sad life in many ways um, she used Valentine and kind of enjoyed using that name because it could be read as a man's name as well. And particularly, you know, the time that she was sort of writing, like the 30s and 40s, you know, her picture would not necessarily be accompanied, uh, would not be accompanying her books, you know, so she could often kind of pass under the radar that way as well. She would often dress up as well in men's clothing um, or sort of quite enjoy being a bit androgynous. Um, and this is just such a heartfelt book, like despite having known nothing about her before reading this book, I was really captivated by just the the brilliant narration of this book and the way it brings things together. Um, and there's a, a sort of an afterword at the end of this book where I just got this really strong feeling that Frances Bingham just really kind of inhabited um, Valentine's world and sort of got to know her a little bit better. And it's just really beautiful watching, you know, watching Frances Bingham um, reach out through history to, to this woman. Um, yeah, I just thought this was really very poignant. I think as well, it's so interesting to sort of see how the challenges of being a woman and being a lesbian or whatever label would kind of work best for, for Valentine um, at the time, how that sort of looked against a sort of literary establishment or whatever else she was never quite as big in her time as um perhaps sort of she could have been partly because at one point they moved away to london uh, away from london to have some privacy but also just because she never really you know a, a sort of a lesbian poet writing often about a love for women was not really ever going to sort of massively do well in the literary elite at the time. So I just thought it was so beautifully done, so clever. And um, yeah, I, I really greatly appreciated this book. Next up, I read two advanced copies of books and these are both now out. So I <laughs> definitely didn't read them that advanced, um, but received them a good amount in advance. Um, so the first was The Unfolding by A.M. Holmes, um, which is a book that is a sort of bit of a satire looking at the political um, set up of the US and particularly focused on um, around the time that George W. Bush was leaving office and the time that Obama was coming into office. Um, and we get quite a lot of characters at the beginning of this book who are really focused on being, you know, completely uh, depressed at the fact that Obama's won, partly because he's a Democrat and they are Republican, partly because their, their guy didn't win generally and also partly there is a sort of tacit acknowledgement that a black man being president of the US is an issue for them and what sort of follows in this book is watching this group of characters who slowly start to kind of come to realize that they are in the wrong um our sort of one of the main characters we spend a lot of time with by the end of the book I think has sort of come to realize that all of the things that he'd previously held you know, firm as sort of his values or whatever, he's also not really meeting, you know, he's sort of talking about the importance of, of fair play or the importance of democracy. And he's sort of protesting a, 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 you know, a free and fair election or, you know, which obviously has some 
some ripples into the the current day in the US, and I'm guessing that's A.M. Holmes's um, sort of point here. You know, instead of focusing it on Trump, for example, looking back and focusing it on a previous time in the US to kind of show that this hasn't this isn't a brand new invention. This has sort of been going on for a while. There were some bits that I thought were really, really funny to this book. Um, I don't know, part of me sort of wanted a little bit more oomph and a little bit more bite in this book, but I still thought it was a really engaging and interesting satire nonetheless. Um, and next I read Eden by Jim Crace. Um, and I previously read his book Harvest, which I loved. Um, and Eden was just this sort of wonderful daydream of a book. It's largely focused around the Garden of Eden, um, and particularly a group of angels, and um, and sort of uh, sort of a mix of sort of ordinary humans and angels, and this sort of really interesting sort of society that's built up around these angels, not only because there are these sort of very specific rules to ensure that certain things don't happen in the garden. So at one point we have somebody kind of tending one of the gardens and she's sort of caught stuffing a tomato into her face, basically. And it's sort of a big no-no because, you know, you know, Adam and Eve and the apple, all that kind of jazz. So yeah, um, but there's this sort of, there's a real sort of light humour to this book, but also it's just incredibly luxurious in the way it talks you know having angels as these characters these these sort of bodies that we you know sort of celestial bodies that we don't normally get to engage with in literature it's so interesting because they sort of have their little foibles and whatever and it's incredibly funny um for those moments but also just really beautiful i thought as a book um and uh, i really greatly enjoyed it and last but not least, I read The Cost of Living by Arundhati Roy. Um, so the former winner of the Booker Prize for The God of Small Things. Um, somebody in the comments suggested The Cost of uh, the cost of Living, a set of essays. So there's just two essays in this book, uh, one of which is sort of talking about more broadly about political corruption um, and sort of um, sort of the governments of India and Pakistan sort of having a bit of a vested interest in there being some kind of... Um, not even competition, but kind of rivalry almost between the two. Um, but also uh, the first one is um, looking a lot at various other parts of the world. So, you know, we've got conversations about dam building and uh, nuclear war in the second essay. So these sort of geopolitical issues and how they affect India, um, particularly um, sort of how the political elite work within that. So she speaks about um, you know, hundreds and uh, thousands of dams being built, um, but these um, these dams are being built at the expense of some of the communities who are then moved out of where they live or whose land is flooded or what have you. And we've suddenly got, you know, it's sort of man playing with nature as well because you've got all these sort of crops that are used to monsoon weather and suddenly being drip fed water throughout the year. What does that what does that do to them? Um, but I think what I just really love about her writing in these essays is that she's always this really brilliant line of being incredibly serious and pointed and sharp and focused, but incredibly funny. There's always a sort of a slight jab to the side. She's still making her point. It's not to water it down at all. But I really just appreciate her kind of, there's a wisdom to her writing that I really greatly appreciate. Um, and she speaks a bit about having won the booker in the second essay of this. Um, in quite an interesting way as well, because she's not, you know, she's not walking around being like, well, I'm the booker winner. She has this real sort of grace of being like, well, that was a thing that happened. And she also says that she finds it quite weird because people congratulate her on winning the prize and what that means for India and don't talk about the book. It's, it's the fact that she's an Indian woman who's won a prize. That's what matters. And she finds that quite a strange distinction because often her sort of instinct is sort of, well, have you read the book? Or actually the things I write in this book maybe criticise some of the things you might like. So actually, you know, um, yeah, but really, really interesting nonetheless. And um, yeah, just really great to read more Arundhati Roy, just because I think she's such a clever writer. And I've really enjoyed the three books of hers now that I've read um, great, a great deal. But those have been the books I've read this week, these sort of mishmash of some some books there it is quite a few um again a couple of short ones but also I've, I've had a lot of train journeys this week so <laughs> there we go lots of sort of long bits of time just with a with a book in front of me which has been glorious um but anyway i hope you're having a wonderful week i've been bob booker take care and speak to you soon bye, -bye.